We're not going to figure out this problem because I don't think it's necessary. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen, right? The elephant's going to die. But let me show you something pretty cool about like how powerful uh, assuming things are spheres actually is. There's so much amazing science has been done like this. So elephants, right? Let's assume an elephant is a sphere. Welcome back, my friends. So before we get into it, you should come sign up for the Daily Dance newsletter if you haven't already. Daily newsletter breaking down the latest in STEM news every single 24 hours. You can sign up in the description. I'm also creating this post quantum VPN uh, and the alpha is about to come out, which will be free. So if you want to get notified when that comes out, come sign up at the other link. You know, programming is hard. These things take time. So we're getting there. Alrighty. What happens if we throw an elephant from a skyscraper? I can't say I've ever thought about this, but, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty standard to get questions like this uh, in early physics. They love to spice it up. But anyway, let's check it out. Let's start this video by throwing a mouse, a dog, and an elephant from a skyscraper onto something soft. Let's say, a stack of mattresses. The mouse lands and is stunned for a moment before it shakes itself off and walks away pretty annoyed because that's a very rude thing to do. The dog breaks all of its bones and dies in an unspectacular way, and the elephant explodes into a red puddle of bones and insides and has no chance to be annoyed. Why does the mouse survive, but the elephant and dog don't? The yeah, answer... Species. Maybe let's not do that. Uh, I remember reading uh, a couple of years ago that WWF basically said uh, that African elephants would be extinct. They're facing extinction by 2040 if we don't do something to stop it. Like literally a couple decades. No more African elephants in the world. Uh, in the wild. You know, it's a bit depressing. So let's uh, keep watching. But I just wanted to you know, bring some awareness to this. Is size. Size is the most underappreciated regulator of living things. Size determines everything about our biology, how we're built, how we experience the world, how we live and die. It does so because the physical laws are different for different sized animals. Life spans seven orders of magnitude, from invisible bacteria to mites, ants, mice, as far as we know, dogs, humans, elephants, and blue whales. Every size lives in its own unique universe right next to... I was to just watching a documentary last night called uh, The Loneliest Whale, The Search for 52. Uh, if you've never watched this or heard about this whale, you should go check it out. It's amazing. There's, so basically, I won't ruin the end of the doco because there's a whole story to it, but there's this whale and it communicates at 52 hertz and there's no other whale in the ocean and that we've detected in history that communicates at this you know, frequency. So we're worried it's like completely all alone and no one can hear it. Should go watch it it's amazing. to each other each with its own rules upsides and downsides we'll explore these different worlds in a series of videos let's get back to the initial question why did our mouse survive the fall because of how scaling size changes everything a principle that we'll meet over and over again very small things for example are practically immune to falling from great heights because the smaller you are the less you care about the effect of gravity Imagine a theoretical spherical animal the size of a marble. It has this is the stock standard, you know, physics joke. Imagine a cow as a sphere. <laughs> There's so much of this sort of thing in physics. It has three features, its length, its surface area, which is covered in skin, and its volume, or all the stuff inside it like organs, muscles, hopes and dreams. If we make it ten times longer, say the size of a basketball, the rest of its features don't just grow ten times, its skin will grow 100 times, and its insides, or its volume, grows by 1,000 times. The volume determines the weight, or more accurately, mass of the animal. The more mass you have, the higher your kinetic energy before you hit the ground, and the stronger the impact shock. The more surface area in relation to your volume or mass you have, the more the impact gets distributed and softened, and also the more air resistance will slow you down. An elephant is so big that it has extremely little surface area in ratio to its volume, so a lot of kinetic energy gets distributed over a small space and the air doesn't slow it down much at all. That's why it's completely destroyed in an impressive explosion of goo when it hits the ground. The other extreme, insects, have a huge surface area in relation to their tiny mass, so you can literally throw an ant from an aeroplane and it will not be seriously harmed. But while falling is irrelevant in the small world, there are other forces that are harmless for us, but extremely dangerous for small beings. Like surface tension, which turns water into a potentially deadly substance for insects. How does it work? 
water has the tendency to stick to itself. Its molecules are attracted to each other through a force called cohesion, which creates a tension on its surface that you can imagine as a sort of invisible skin. For us, this skin is so weak that we don't even notice it normally. If you get wet, about 800 grams of water, or about 1% of your body weight, sticks to you. A wet mouse has about 3 grams of water sticking to it, which is more than 10% of its body weight. Imagine having 8 full water bottles sticking to you when you leave the shower. But for an insect, the force of water's surface tension is so strong that getting wet is a question of life and death. If we were to shrink you to the size of an ant and you touch water, it would be like you were reaching into glue. It would quickly engulf you, its surface tension too hard for you to break, and you'd drown. I think we all so, learned about this uh, in that movie, Bugs. <laughs> Such a good movie. Insects evolved to be water repellent. For one, their exoskeleton is covered with a thin layer of wax, just like a car. This makes their surface at least partly water repellent because it can't stick to it very well. Many insects are also covered with tiny hairs that serve as a barrier. They vastly increase their surface area and prevent the droplets from touching their exoskeleton and make it easier to get rid of droplets. To make use of surface tension, evolution cracked nanotechnology billions of years before us. Some insects have evolved a surface covered by a short and extremely dense coat of water-repelling hair. Some have more than a million hairs per square millimeter. When the insect dives underwater, air stays inside their fur and forms a coat of air. Water can't enter because the hairs are too tiny to break its surface tension. But it gets even better. As the oxygen of the air bubble runs out, new oxygen diffuses into the bubble from the water around it, while the carbon dioxide diffuses outwards into the water. And so the insect carries its own outside lung around and can basically breathe underwater thanks to surface tension. This is the same principle that enables pond skaters to walk on water, by the way. Tiny anti-water hairs. The smaller you get, the weirder the environment becomes. At some point, even air becomes more and more solid. Let's now zoom down to the smallest insects known, about half the size of a grain of salt, only 0.15 millimeters long, the fairy fly. They live in a world even weirder than other insects. For them, air itself is like thin jello, a syrup-like mass surrounding them at all times. Movement through it is not easy. Flying on this level is not like elegant gliding. They have to kind of grab and hold on to air. So their wings look like big hairy arms rather than proper insect wings. They literally swim through the air like a tiny gross alien through syrup. Things only become stranger from here on as we explore more universes of different sizes. The physical rules are so different for each size that evolution had to engineer around them over and over as life grew in size in the last billion years. So why are there no ants the size of horses? Why no elephants the size of amoeba? Why? Let's assume an elephant is a sphere. So why don't elephants get any bigger than what they currently are? Well, we can answer this with physics. You can do a lot of biology with just uh, with some physics. So let me show you. So imagine we have two elephants, right? We've got one elephant. That's an elephant. <laughs> then you got a bigger elephant, okay? Now, the great thing about elephants are that they're so simple to estimate a few things because they're so simple. They're spheres. <laughs> so, for example, let's say the let's imagine the radius of this elephant is one, and the radius of this this elephant is two. Okay. <laughs> So now we just need to know some things. So first of all, we have to remember uh, what's the volume of a sphere. Now, some of you are going to you know, crack it and go, and some of you will know it, but you don't actually have to know anything. Uh, this is what's great about physics. You know, like take medicine or being a doctor, right? You've got to remember a lot of things. Physics, don't actually have to remember anything. And so what do we know about volume? What do we measure volume in, right? Cubic something. Cubic meters. Cubic something, right? And so that means uh, it's the cube of something. <laughs> nice thing about a sphere is it's only got one scale, the radius. Uh, oh, so the volume of a sphere is proportional to r cubed. Okay. R cubed. What do we measure area? Square. Uh, the 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 radius is r. The 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 area is r squared, proportional to. That's all you need to know, my friends. That's an elephant. <laughs> and what's the mass of this big? elephant the mass of course is going to be the amount of stuff and if they're made out of the same material 
the amount of stuff is going to be proportional to the volume of the elephant, right? And so the amount of stuff of the big elephant, if it's twice the radius, the mass uh, is eight times as big, okay? Uh, as this one down here, the mass one. This one has mass eight in some set of units. And so what's what's the surface area to go? Well, the surface area goes as R squared. So the surface area is four times bigger than this one, right? All right, so now let's think about what holds an elephant together. It's pressure. The pressure of the skin is holding the elephant against the pressure of the elephant standing there hanging over, okay? And so pressure is force per unit area. And well, the force of the elephant is on the skin is the mass, right? So the mass per unit area gives you the pressure. And now we see that eight times the mass and only four times the surface area. So the pressure on the skin is twice as big. And if it's made of the same stuff, you know, if you make an elephant that's too big, it'll fall apart. <laughs> the skin just won't hold. And so that's why we know you don't have bigger elephants because eventually they fall apart, which is embarrassing. Much more like an elephant, right? <laughs> little sphere attached to a bigger sphere with a little rod in between, right? You got a head attached to a body, right? Uh, by neck. And what's the strength of a rod? Proportional, right? It's proportional to the cross-sectional area of the rod. And so we've done the necessary work. We know if this rod is twice as twice the radius of this rod, then the cross-sectional area is four times as big as this, right? Uh, but we know the head is eight times more massive. And this is why the dinosaurs became extinct. It's actually really kind of simple. You can't make large animals with big heads. God says no. They have to be stupid. Because eventually, uh, the strength of the rod holding up the uh, neck, holding up the head, sorry, uh, will not be able to hold up the head. And so dinosaurs, you know, they're very huge animals, massive, right? With a small little head. And... That's, you know, like biology depends on the laws of physics. And, you know, that's why dinosaurs had small heads. And with that, just by thinking of, yeah, we've now discovered why the largest animals with brains are not on land. They're, they're, they're in the water because the buoyancy can hold up your neck. And, you know, that's why whales and dolphins have the largest brains on Earth. And look how much you can learn just from uh, picturing a sphere, right? So I just wanted to show you that little example of why it's powerful to m imagine things as spheres. So the whole point of all of that is that, uh, you know, if you draw a more realistic picture of an elephant, it doesn't matter. Like, it, everything's still the same. So you can throw out the stuff you don't need and know, like, the, the, the details of the shape of the elephant, right? So you, isn't that cool? So I remember seeing some new research last year uh, that basically found that elephants dilate their nostrils in order to create more space in their trunks, right? Which allows them to store up to like nine liters of water in there. And they can also suck up like three liters uh, per second. And that's a speed uh, of 30 times faster than a human sneeze, right? Which is like 150 meters per second, which is 330 miles per hour. The study was basically trying to understand physics of how elephants use their trunks to move and manipulate air food and like other objects right uh and they were trying to learn uh if the mechanics could inspire you know more efficient robots right that could use air motion to hold and move things so elephants trunks are kind of sounding like the swiss army knife of biology this reminds me of a video from last year we made and we we were talking about the physics of poo and how elephants uh like why it takes elephants the same amount of time to poo to defecate as humans it's actually Kind of interesting, a unified theory of uh, poo. <laughs> I can't remember the video. I think it was the My Hero Academia, so we won't go over it again. You can go watch that if you want to hear about that. And then we also talked about how penguins, uh, when they poo, it kind of like explodes and goes everywhere. <laughs> and they brought a physicist in to design like the barricades because they had to know how far penguins could poo because you know people at aquariums and stuff were getting pooed on. Uh, they just launch poo at people. But anyway. 